A warm welcome to our viewers here in Nigeria and around the world. Thanks for joining us on the program uh, this one hour. I'm Jockey Rogers here in Lagos. Checking in on the United States and the politics there in this election year, former President Donald Trump appeared in court in New York today for the closing day of his civil fraud trial as lawyers of both sides made their final arguments. Mr. Trump's defense attorney, Chris uh, Kissy uh, claims that the case against his client was manufactured for political reasons, alleging further that the Attorney General Letitia James is trying to put someone who has been part of the fabric of the New York real estate out of business. Earlier, Mr. Trump addressed the press outside the courtroom, describing the case as a constitutional witch hunt authorized by President Joe Biden. He spoke against the judge not allowing him to make a submission. He is, however, scheduled to give a comprehensive press conference after the court session. Mr. Trump and his two adult sons have already been found liable of massively inflating the value of their properties by hundreds of millions of dollars. They deny any wrongdoing. The trial is focusing on a more narrow set of six remaining counts of fraud and also any penalties the Trumps must pay. Well, the former president will have one less challenger in the race to the White House and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie announced on Wednesday he will be suspending his 2024 presidential campaign, pulling him out of the running for president. During a press conference last night, it's clear to me uh, tonight that there isn't a path for me to win the nomination, which is why I'm suspending my campaign for president of the United States. Uh, those were his comments during that address. He said further, I want to promise you this. I'm going to make sure that in no way do I enable Donald Trump to ever be president of the United States again. That's more important than my own personal ambition. A source within his campaign said that says that he is not expected to make any endorsement right now. The decision removes the most high profile and consistent critic of Mr. Trump still in the Republican primary campaign. Meanwhile, last night also saw Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley spa on, an, uh, on a stage in, at a Republican presidential debate in Iowa. Iowa is the first in the state-by-state -state contest to decide who in the Republican Party will contest the general election, probably against Democratic President Joe Biden in November. The debate was full of both trading insults. DeSantis referred to Nikki Haley's arguments as a word salads to confuse voters and backtrack on comments made on Israel, education, Ukraine and others while Haley counteracted uh, DeSantis' arguments, referring to them as DeSantisLies.com. Both, uh, however, noted the former President Donald Trump needed to have been at the debate of defense some of the decisions made while he was in office. Both clashed on immigration, again, Ukraine and the war in Gaza. And while Mr. DeSantis was, got, uh, got more cheers, Nikki Haley was said to have, had, have uh, claimed the victory for that uh, particular debate. Let's bring in our Washington correspondent, Maria Bird. Maria, great to see you today. Thank you. Right, so it was an interesting debate between Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis last night. Not once did either flicker on the barbs and insults traded. Yes, um, I think they were both prepared for that. That is very in alignment with their style of debate. Um, we have seen them um, and whether or not they have been speaking about each other individually on their campaign trail or in a debate type setting. We've seen this before. So I don't think anyone was surprised at the spars that were going back and forth. That has kind of been the nature and culture of this Republican campaign season. Uh, it was clear they missed the other Republican challenger, you know, former President Donald Trump, who has said that he will not be attending the first few debates. But on the issues of Israel, immigration and Ukraine, both DeSantis and Haley sounded like they were on the same page. There wasn't much difference in the points they both tried to distinguish. 
You're very much in alignment, I think, with where most Americans are uh, that have responded to this debate and seeing uh, that the Republican Party is going to support Israel. And so they would have been definitely standing outside of uh, the Republican Party and kind of the Republican tradition of supporting Israel. Obviously, um, they did speak to, um, even if things were very drastic uh, within the conflict between the, in the Gaza, if they were to remove all Palestinians, they tried to speak around that because obviously that becomes a humanitarian rights uh, concern um, and Democrats are going to jump on that as Democrats have definitely been in support of ensuring that Palestinians are treated fairly and that this uh, war understanding all people and I think the Republican Party um, that is a, a real distinct difference and Nikki Haley nor Ron DeSantis has really steered far away from that. And uh, do you think that the you know, viewers consider the debate a little flat because of Mr. Trump's you know, absence? It usually gives life to those sort of things. Well, I think some could say flat. I think that it also um, kind of created somewhat of a split for those who only had to look at those two candidates. I think that neither one of them, if you if you really poll Americans who are looking to see who will be their Republican candidate, those in the Republican Party, they were pretty split between the two. So to say there was not a, a highlighted moment or something to kind of give that um, uh, entertainment factor that I think many people have seen um, as former President Trump was in the debates, I think is correct. And I think that we um, have seen that exactly through what you're saying and through uh, having pretty much of a draw um, on this debate and not having anyone come out as the real winner. Right. And if Mr. Trump had attended the debate yesterday, uh, how do you reckon it could have gone, you know, having been in such debates before, uh, the splits between, you know, DeSantis and Haley, do you think others will have, you know, gone outrightly to say that maybe tr Mr. Trump claimed the victory if he had attended, that is? Well, we've seen it before, right? We've seen uh, the former president hail victory, even if uh, there were pollsters that saw something different in the debate. And so I think that's something that we could potentially surmise based off of previous history. I think you also mentioned something important, which is the fact that we probably would have had a surprise response to some questions and maybe something that stands outside of the traditional Republican uh, model of, of thought. It may be something that more aligned with the MAGA uh, thought process and, and kind of theology and ideologies. And so I think we are um, looking at a upcoming uh, campaign season that will be very different. Um, the former president says that he will also be at the uh, debates as it gets closer to the election time. But you also remember that he's right before court. Um, you all just talked about his court case with New York right now. So that would have definitely brought a different element to the conversation uh, that obviously was not able to be any type of focal point um, due to the fact that he was not there yesterday. Yes, and so Chris Christie, let's talk about someone else's out of the race before now. Uh, did he stand a better chance than any of the candidates last night? Chris Christie, as we all know, is a seasoned uh, politician. Um, he has obviously been in the uh, a, a huge factor in the Republican Party and a huge uh, influence in the Republican Party. So it would have been it looked a little different. I think some moderate Republicans, we might have seen them speak a little bit more um, as to uh, their interest in the debate. I think that uh, Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis um, don't necessarily speak to those moderate um, Republicans who might have more aligned with Chris Christie. So that is something that will bring a different element to the race. And the question is, does that mean those who are more in alignment with the ideology of Chris Christie, uh, if they will not vote at all, um, or if they could potentially uh, vote for a different party? And uh, he says he will not be endorsing Donald Trump. He, it, that can't be good for the party, seeing as Mr. Trump is still the main challenger for the party. Yes, I think we've known that for quite some time now. I don't think that's a surprise to many Americans that he would not be endorsing the former president. 
uh, as the former president and, and when he decides if he is able to join a debate, I think that's when we'll really get to see the type of impact. Um, I think that we've seen such a split in the Republican Party. The question is, how deep has the split gone? And are there um, the number of Republicans that are in alignment with the former president? Do they outweigh uh, those more moderate and traditional Republicans? Right, Maria, thank you for that update and see you again soon. Bye-bye. Well, staying with politics in the U.S., President Joe Biden continues to work to ensure that black voters believe in his commitment to the black community as he announced the nomination of Melissa uh, DuBose as a black woman judge in Rhode Island. The White, uh, the White House states that so this is an effort to build a judicial system reflective of the americans it defends and protects our washington correspondent maria bird is here once more with an update on that story first bill press thank you so much for joining us special assistant and special counsel to the president we know this is a historic day and a major announcement has come out regarding a new supreme justice nominee yeah, so uh, thanks so much, Maria, for, for having me. Um, the president today announced the nomination of Judge Melissa DuBose to the District of, of Rhode Island. Um, judge DuBose is a historic nominee. The District of Rhode Island has never had a black judge um, at the Article III uh, life tenured level, um, has never had a person of color at all. Um, judge DuBose is an exceptionally accomplished jurist exceptionally qualified. Um, she has been on the state court bench since 2019. That followed uh, a really um, outstanding, distinguished career as an in-house counsel um, and as a, as a prosecutor at the state level in, in Rhode Island. Um, there are a handful of districts in the country um, that have never had a black judge, have never had a person of color. Um, I think President Biden and Senate Democrats have made it a priority um, to try to um, remedy and rectify that, you know, historic wrong. Um, it's important that the bench, uh, the federal bench, looks like the communities that judges serve. That instills confidence in the judiciary. Um, it, it, it ensures that those appearing before judges um, feel that the outcome is fair, even if it's not the outcome that they want. And that's in the civil context. It's in the criminal context. I think importantly here, um, the announcement today, um, it builds on um, a commitment that the president made even before he took office. Um, we have, of course, seen the appointment of, of Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, the first black woman ever uh, to serve on the Supreme Court. Um, but I want to just share a few other stats with you, if, if that's OK. Um, as of today, uh, 167 of the president's lifetime uh, tenured judicial nominees have been confirmed. Of those, um, 53 are black. Um, for a little bit of context, Trump appointed 11 black judges, and in eight years, President Obama appointed 62. Um, now, that's not a knock on President Obama. That is a record still, that, that 62. But in just three years, President Biden has appointed 85% of the total number of black judges that President Obama appointed um, in eight years. I think that's really um, a testament to President Biden's commitment um, to bringing diversity to the bench, and in particular um, to uh, to appointing highly, highly qualified black judges across the country. Digging just a little bit deeper, of the 53 black judges who have been confirmed, 33 are black women. That is a record. Never before has a, a single president um, appointed 33 black women to the bench. In addition to Justice Jackson, that includes 13 black women appointed to the federal circuit courts. And that's more black women appointed to the circuit courts than all other previous administrations combined. The, the number was eight um, until President Biden. And there are a number of historic firsts um, among those circuit court appointees. Judge Ariana Freeman, the first black woman to serve on the third circuit, which covers Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Judge Dana Douglas, the first black woman to serve on the Fifth Circuit, which covers Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. 
and Judge Nancy Abudu, the first black woman to serve on the 11th Circuit, which covers Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. At this very moment, the Senate is actually voting on Judge Cato Cruz for the District of Colorado, assuming he's confirmed. Of course, the number will rise from 53 black judges to 54. Um, the president, of course, did not choose Judge DuBose, did not choose to nominate Judge DuBose because she is black. He chose to nominate Judge DuBose because she is an exceptionally qualified nominee. Um, but uh, I think the president is extremely mindful, as are uh, Senate Democrats, and, and in particular do want to give credit to uh, the Rhode Island senators for, for recommending Judge DuBose. Um, everyone is, is mindful of the importance of bringing diversity to the bench, of making the bench look like the community as a whole. Um, and we are just extremely proud of Judge DuBose uh, and this historic nomination. So, uh, you know, you bring up some very key points and highlighting those statistics that many people might naturally understand. But one of the things our audience is majority international is understanding that New England is not necessarily an overly diverse community. Um, and to have a black woman judge in Rhode Island, what is that going to do? And what was the strategic thoughts from the president around ensuring that a community that might not be um, a very large African-American percentage there? I think a, a couple of things. First, um, Judge DuBose uh, was born and raised um, in Providence. Um, so she is um, a daughter of, the, of Rhode Island, a daughter of, of Providence. Um, that alone instills confidence. Um, and it's not just confidence among litigants who appear before her. It's confidence among those who are considering careers in the law. It's confidence for those who want to know do I have a path to the bench? Um, she, she grew up um, in challenging circumstances. She was a teacher for many years, giving back to the community in that way. And now she's giving back to the community, um, I don't want to say in a greater way, just in a different way. Um, and you're absolutely right. New England, Rhode Island, not places uh, with um, a high percentage of, of people of color. Um, but uh, for, for the black community in Rhode Island, for the black community in New England uh, more broadly, I think seeing the appointment of somebody like Judge DuBose shows the president um, takes this seriously. Um, the president is following through on his commitments. Um, and I, I think for the entire community, because everyone should know, black or white, uh, you know, Judge DuBose is accomplished, is qualified, is credentialed, is experienced, and is ready for the job. And so I, I think that the confidence in her ability um, is, is going to be widespread. And lastly, before we close, we know there's racial inequity. We know there's all types of racial issues when it comes to sentencing. What is the hope with a diverse group of individuals the president is appointing, and obviously this most recent appointment, um, what is his hope with that, with making sure that sentencing is fair and is not racially biased? Sure. You know, the, the statute that governs sentencing in federal cases, um, of course, does not permit judges to take race into account. But that doesn't mean that judges have not taken race into account in um, a harmful, negative way. I think um, by appointing judges who come from diverse uh, demographic and professional backgrounds, um, so those, for instance, who have been public defenders or civil rights lawyers, I think what you are saying, what the president is saying is um, we need to take a close look at sentencing. We need to make sure that the statute a statute that says race should not be a factor in handing down a harsher sentence to make sure that that statute uh, is actually being taken into account, um, is actually uh, is actually being followed. Um, and so I think bringing those different perspectives um, will help ensure a level playing field. Well, Bill Priest, Special Assistant to the President and Special Counsel, we thank you so much for joining us and um, have a great day. Thank you, Maria. You too. Welcome back. In 2011, Gianni Toivola became the first man of African descent to become a parliamentarian in Finland. Now 46, the Kenyan Finn, who has endured isolation and discrimination, has retired from politics but still pursues acting 
and dancing. Mr. Toivola was speaking at a lecture with foreign journalists to educate them on his experiences and Finland's evolution. It's sometimes even harder. Finland's first black parliamentarian, Johnny Toivola, was born to a Kenyan father and Finnish mother in the city of Vasa in Finland. It speaks of how the conversation about racist experiences is becoming easier to hold now than back when he was appointed an MP in 2011. Even though there's not so many black people, but there are black people, brown people, and for the first time we are coming together in one room and we're having discussions with each other. So I think this coming together also supports this, that there's more space to acknowledge one's experiences or to say out loud that I'm experiencing racism and that it is racism or what is racism. He believes his life in the public space was a boost to his gaining a position in parliament. I, I would say that maybe in my story there's a lot of privilege also in the sense that before I became an MP, um, I was an actor and a performer. Uh, and I also hosted some TV shows. So I, I was already quite a, like a public figure in Finland, uh, but more acting and entertainment and nothing to do with politics. But then, of course, everything is politics. Being a black person in a Finnish TV is already kind of political. <laughs> uh, and just being yourself is a statement and creates all kinds of reactions from people. So I first started to kind of tell my own personal story, my background and my experiences, and I was just invited more and more to talk on different stages and all of a sudden I found myself in news broadcasts talking with other politicians and decision makers and um, ministers. I was still the entertainment person and everybody else was from the political are arena. But then I somehow discovered that I, I, oh, I'm able to function here as well. In 2018, Mr. Toivola announced he would not be returning for a third term as an MP. The ex-parliamentarian, who was in the arts before his appointment, says even though more people are opening up to speaking about the experiences, there's still a lot to be done to eliminate the phenomenon of racism and inequality. Elsewhere, hundreds of tractors and trucks were seen blockade, uh, blockading a major road near Berlin's Brandenburg gates on Wednesday as farmers staged a demonstration against the German government's decision to cut fuel subsidies for agriculture. Footage shows the protesting farmers who arrived in the German capital a day earlier preparing food with outdoor grills on Strasse the 17 Junie and standing amid vehicles displaying banners with slogans such as the traffic lights are red, the economy will soon be dead. German farmers have been joining nationwide demonstrations since the beginning of the week against cuts in agricultural tax breaks. The decision to cut subsidies came with the coalition government under pressure to fill a 17 billion euro hole in the 2024 budget. And we end with a story that rekindles our faith in science and medicine as doctors at the Krasnodar Clinical Hospital in St. Petersburg, Russia, restored the face of a 24-year-old Kadim Demi, a Senegalese who suffers from cancer. Kadim was born albino in the village of Bombali due to the hot, dry climate. He developed severe uh, melanoma. He says the nearest health center was 10 kilometers away from his village. And he says he was put in a dying room where he saw people dying in front of him every day. He was later told that if he wanted to fight for his life, he would need to go to other clinics, which were more expensive and uh, much further away from the village. Thankfully, founder of the Russian charity Miller for Africa, Miller Anofriva, stepped in to help. By the time she offered assistance, Kadim was completely uh, emaciated and his face uh, disfigured by a large ulcer. His family had also run out of money and local doctors said he had only a month to live. Donations were made to the charity via social media where he his condition was highlighted and by August of last year doctors in Russia had performed four complex operations on Kadin to shape his the missing part of his lip, inserted a denture and rebuilt his cheek in place of the hole. Now Kadim is resting with his uh, 
father in St. Petersburg after the first stage of treatment. The young man can already breathe, eat and talk. In spring, specialists will continue to work on restoring his face. Oh, that's such a very, very an endearing case there. Well, that's it on our program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Jocket Rogers.